When we're flying along the cruise, we need to be able to calculate how much more distance we can cover with the amount of fuel that we have in our tanks. Otherwise, we might run out of fuel halfway along our journey. But how do we calculate this figure? Let's find out. Hi, I'm Grant and welcome to the eighth class in the performance series. Today we're going to be taking a look at range, which is basically a measure of efficiency. Range will dictate how far we can fly for and which airports we can visit, so it's important to understand how we calculate the range for the fuel that we have on board or the maximum amount of fuel we can put in the tanks. Specific range is the distance an aircraft flies through the air per unit of fuel used. If we add in the effects of wind, we get the specific ground range, the distance we actually cover over the ground rather than through the air because wind will cause the parcel of air that we're flying in to move along the ground as we're flying through it. Think of it like we're flying inside a big train. If the train is stationary, we just fly to the end of the train, but if the train is moving, we'll fly to the end of the train, but the whole thing has moved, so our position relative to the ground will be different. If there's no wind, think of the train being stationary, then our specific range R and our S uh, our specific ground range, sorry, will be the same. The units for specific range will be nautical miles per kilogram of fuel used. And if we divide by time, we can get two formulas, one for a specific range and one for a specific ground range. The one for a specific range, the air distance, would be the true airspeed over fuel flow. And for ground range, we just need to factor in wind. And we can do that by using the ground speed, which is uh, the TAS plus or minus any wind component and then divide that by the fuel flow as well. Depending on the conditions we are flying in, we need a certain amount of thrust that we need to overcome all of the thrust required or the drag that is produced when we fly. Thrust generation requires us to use up fuel and how much fuel depends on the specific fuel consumption of the engine. This is basically a measure of engine efficiency and it is the amount of fuel flow needed to produce one unit of thrust in a jet aircraft and a propeller, it's the amount of uh, fuel used to produce one unit of power. Why is this important though? Well, we already have a formula for a specific range and specific ground range, but we can break down the fuel flow into a little bit more detail. If we first have a look at the jet aircraft, then we can substitute in the value for specific fuel consumption into the specific range equation and get specific range is equal to the true air speed over the specific fuel consumption times drag, or the amount of thrust required for that phase of flight. Or if we want to find the specific ground range, we just have to substitute in ground speed. For a propeller, it is slightly different. The difference is that bottom line, where we have to have the consideration of specific fuel consumption per unit of power. So we get the same equations but on the bottom line, it's power required at that phase of flight. So why have we substituted in those values for instead of fuel flow, basically? Well, it basically allows us to see a bit more clearly the factors that affect fuel flow and our specific range. So if we look at this one, for example, we know that if the specific fuel consumption is high and the drag is high, that means that we're going to be dividing by a larger number and that means our specific range is going to go down. If we take the specific ground range of the propeller, for instance, if we have a low specific fuel consumption and a low amount of power required, we're dividing by a small number, which means our ground range is going to be high. It's just an easy way to analyze. Range is influenced according to a number of factors. Most of them you can figure out by looking at the equations that we've just worked out. But first, we're going to have a look at mass. If we compare a light aircraft to a heavy one, the total drag curves look like this, mainly because heavier aircraft need to produce more lift and more induced drag is generated as a result. This means that on the lighter aircraft, the drag is lower when we fly at the speed for max range, which now that I think about it, I've not actually talked about the speed for max range. So let's just do a little sidebar here. So max range is called VMR, or if you're flying at Mach numbers, MMR, speed Mach number. And it occurs where we maximize our thrust to drag ratio 
And in a turbojet or a jet in general, this occurs at 1.32 VMD. And this is the tangent on this curve. So if you go something like that, this value here is our VMR, which will be 1.32 VMD. In a propeller driven aircraft, we take the tangent to the power curve, not this drag curve. And it's the same effect. We're maximizing our thrust to drag or thrust to power required um, ratio. And this actually occurs therefore at 1.32 VMP, speed for minimum power, which coincidentally is actually VMD because the speed for minimum power is 0.76 VMD and 0.76 times 1.32 equals close enough one. So it's therefore equal to the speed for minimum drag. So what was I saying? Yes, lighter aircraft um, have less drag, basically. And if you look at the equations for both turbojet and propeller aircraft, the bottom line has drag in it or power required, which is essentially drag times speed. So if you have a lower amount of drag, that means you're dividing by a smaller number, which means your specific range goes up. Simple as that. And also take note that if we are um, lighter, our speed for VMR would be a bit slower as well. So that would be VMR in the heavy aircraft. And then as we get lighter, our speed slows down. Same for the propellers. If an aircraft is flying at its optimum altitude, the range will be maximized. This optimum altitude in a turbojet is high up. Basically, the engines are running at their designed RPM because they're designed to cruise because that's where they spend most of their time. And that's where they are most efficient, making the specific fuel consumption low. And also up at altitude, the air is less dense, meaning drag is lower. So our specific range goes up and our specific ground range would go up as well. In a propeller driven aircraft, the optimum altitude isn't as simple as it depends on throttle position and propeller RPM combinations. And optimum combinations and altitudes are often tested out and put in manufacturer's manuals. So it's hard to say, but it's not gonna be quite as high up. It's gonna be the position for basically maximum throttle open. So altitude and mass are the two biggest influencers on commercial flights. So this is an example of a step climb. It's something that you see quite often. So say we first reach our cruising altitude of 30,000 feet. We're heavy and full of fuel. And as we cruise along, we burn fuel and weight as a result. This means that our drag reduces because we're needing less lift and therefore the specific range increases, which is good. We're lowering our drag, specific range goes up. This reduction in drag and a lower um, speed for maximum range requires less thrust to be used. So the engines don't have to work as hard, so the RPM of the engine of the re can reduce. This means that the engine may no longer be operating in its ideal range, which is typically um, around 90 to 95%. So we counterintuitively want to make the engines work a bit harder again to get them back into this efficient range. We do this by climbing into less dense air, meaning more air has to pass through the engine in order to generate the correct amount of thrust, and the engine has to rotate faster as a result, pushing us back up into the ideal RPM range. This means that throughout the flight, our optimum altitude to keep the engines working in the efficient 90 to 95% range steadily climbs as we go throughout the flight, as we burn weight. In practice though, we can't slowly climb along as we fly, because if everyone was doing it, there'd be a ridiculous number of collisions in the air. So what we do is we fly at one altitude, 30,000 feet at the start, maybe slightly above the optimum altitude. Then as we burn fuel, the optimum altitude will climb up to meet us, then pass through our level. Once it reaches a thousand feet or so above, we would request to climb up to the next level, 32,000 feet, then again, it would climb up to reach us and so on and so forth throughout the flight um, until we reach the structural limit of the aircraft. 
This is known as a step climb and it's something you do almost every flight when you're flying commercially just to save fuel by flying as close to the optimum altitude as possible. So wind influences the specific ground range but not the specific air range. The specific range is the specific air range but it's just called specific range. So basically it's because TAS and ground speed, while well, TAS isn't affected by wind and ground speed is equal to TAS plus or minus whatever wind component you've got. So obviously the wind has an influence on this specific ground range, but nothing to do with the specific air range. So if we had a tailwind, our ground speed goes up and our specific range wouldn't change, but the specific ground change would go down as a result. Wait, did I say tailwind? If it's a tailwind, it would go up. If it's a headwind, the specific ground range would go down. So that's how we get our maximum range out of an aircraft, but it does require us to fly at MMR or VMR, which might be a bit slow to get to our destination on time to pick up more passengers or pick up some cargo, etc. So there's a commercial element we need to think about. For this, there's a speed generated for using um, during the long range cruise, and it's called VLRC. This is a speed that's slightly faster than the speed for max range. So there is going to be a bit more fuel burn, but it's calculated so that you get um, about 4% speed increase with about 1% fuel burn reduction or reduction in range fuel burn increase. And companies use this as a bit of a trade-off. And there's also a speed which is called um, VECON. To be honest, they're very rarely going to be V speeds, they're going to be max speeds. And the way we figure out the econ speed is by using uh, the cost index. The cost index, which I talked about briefly in the class before, is usually in a range between 1 and 50, from at least, at least from what I've seen anyway. You could get higher, I don't know. Boeing and Airbus both use it, but I'm not sure about other manufacturers. And it's basically a trade-off between speed of flight and amount of fuel burn. If you have a really low cost index, you'd save a lot of fuel, but fly really slow. And a high cost index would be the reverse, fast flight, burning lots of fuel. We're given this cost index by the flight planning department, depending on how fast they need us to fly to arrive on time according to some timetables or slots or something like that at airports. We then pop it into a computer on the aircraft and a Mach number for econ in the cruise. Our econ speed is generated and that's what we fly through the flight. Okay, so a specific air range or just specific range is the true air speed divided by the fuel flow. And the fuel flow is specific fuel consumption times drag for a jet. And for a propeller, it is specific fuel consumption times power required. Think of drag as thrust required, maybe that might help. And if you want to convert them into specific ground range, you just need to factor in the wind. And to do that, you just convert the TAS into a ground speed because ground speed equals TAS plus or minus any wind component that's helping you. The speeds for max range speed MMR is going to be 1.32 times VMD. That's basically the tangent to the drag curve where our thrust to drag ratio is maximized. In a propeller, it's slightly different. It's tangent to the power required graph um, and the tangent can, means that our ratio of thrust to power required is maximized and that occurs at 1.32 vmp which just because of the maths happens to be vmt vmt vmd sorry um yeah because vmp is 0 0.76 times vmd and 0 0.76 times 1.32 is basically one so things that influence our level of range, our range, specific air range, for example, is influenced by mass. If we have more mass, it means we have more drag. And when we have more drag, we need more thrust, which means our specific fuel consumption goes up. And that means that, uh, well, no, our specific fuel consumption doesn't go up. We just need more thrust. But anyway, it has the same effect of reducing our range. Altitude for a jet basically means that we're operating in the ideal zone for our engines and the drag is lower, meaning that the specific range goes up. In a propeller aircraft, it's a bit different. 
uh, you basically fly at what the manufacturer has tested and found to be the most efficient. Wind has no influence over the specific air range, but it obviously has a huge impact on the specific ground range because TAS plus or minus wind equals ground speed. If you had a headwind, you would have a lower ground speed and that would mean a lower specific ground range, for example. The speeds that we fly, if we have MMR, we're gonna fly at max range, that's gonna be the best for us. Um, if we fly at long range cruise, we're getting 4% faster for 1% reduction in range, a bit more fuel burn. And normally we fly at M econ speed, which is according to the cost index, that range of one to 50, um, telling us how fast to fly um, and how much fuel to burn.